Thank you, Dr. Hawa. It's great to be with you today and great to be here with all of you in this beautiful place of Dubai. What a wonderful place to be at, and at, also to be here at this summit with all of you and to share with you some of the work that we're doing in the area of regenerative medicine. Basically, this is a little bit of a history for you. This is a painting that hangs at the Countway Library at Harvard Medical School and it shows the very first time an organ was actually transplanted. In the back room, you see Harwell Harrison, who was a urologist, retrieving the organ. While in the front room, you see Joe Mary, the transplant surgeon, getting ready to implant the organ, which happened to be a kidney. And this was back in 1954. So many advances that have happened since then, but still definite challenges in terms of organ shortage and rejection. And that's where this field comes in that we call regenerative medicine. Because the statistics are fairly serious. Every 30 seconds, a patient dies from diseases that could be treated with organ or tissue replacement. So wouldn't it be great if we could regenerate ourselves? Is that science fiction? Not really. Actually, there are many examples in nature where things just regenerate. This is actually a salamander limb, and this was injured, and you can see real-time lapse photography of how that limb spontaneously regenerates within a period of only a couple of weeks. So the question, of course, is if a salamander can do it, why can't we? Well, the fact is that we're constantly regenerating. I don't know if you know this, but your skin turns over about every two weeks. Your bones turn over about every 10 years. And your brain turns over, your brain cells turn over about every 20 years, which explains the behavior of some of our teenagers. But we're actually constantly regenerating. So basically, this field that we call regenerative medicine really tries to bring together many different areas. The areas of using cells alone, using cells and materials together, or using what we call enabling technologies like 3D printing that we will speak about. But first, let's talk about the basics of the technology. What is regenerative medicine? How can we actually create therapies for patients? One method is just to use cells alone. And this is an example of one technology that is currently being used in patients. This is actually a picture of what your skin looks like under the microscope, if you were to actually draw a picture of what your skin looks like. And if you have an injury in the skin, you can have either a superficial injury, a medium-sized injury, a deep injury. And if you have a deeper injury, you can have a scar. So the question is, how can you regenerate the skin? And this is actually the work of Dr. Fiona Wood, where basically a piece of skin is taken from the patient, the cells are processed, the cells are expanded right there in the operating room and sprayed right on the patient. And this is a clinical trial that's currently ongoing, 10 centers throughout the US, led at Wake Forest University, using these technologies for burn patients uh, basically on a regular basis at this point. We can also use cells and materials together, and this is reserved for now more substantial defects in the body. This is an example of a defect of a patient who presented with a motor vehicle accident with a ruptured urethra. That's the organ that connects the bladder to the outside of the body. And basically, you're supposed to see a long tube coming from the bladder in that area, and basically what you see there is this big gap. And instead of having that gap, what we do then is we basically have to re repair that surgically, but you don't have that organ there. So what we do is we go to the patient, we take a very small piece of tissue less than half the size of a postage stamp, we then basically tease the cells apart from that small tissue that we took out of the body, we then expand the cells outside the body. We then create a tubular structure with biomaterials. And we then coat the outside with one cell type. 
and we coat the inside with another cell type, very much like baking a layer cake, if you will. You're doing it one layer at a time. Once you put the cells in the material, you put this in an oven-like device, which is basically an incubator, has the same conditions as your human body, as a human body, then you're able to take that structure out and put it right back into the patient. The whole process takes about six weeks. From the time you take the small piece of tissue from the patient to the time that you put in an engineered organ back into the patient. These materials that we use to basically seat the cells on them are materials that we use in surgery every day. These are materials that are basically very similar to suture materials, the sutures that you have in surgery. They basically dissolve in the body within a few months. So basically, here you see in this next picture, on the far left, you see the actual x-ray of the defect. In the, in the next panel, you see the actual scaffold alone. Then in the next panel, you see these bioreactors, these machines that we use to mature the tissue. And on the far right, you actually see the engineered structure that's going to be implanted surgically. And now you see the outcome on the patient. On the far left, you see the x-ray with a major defect present. And then on the middle, you see the new organ that has been created using the patient's own cells. What happens to the material that we put in? It goes away. What happens to the cells that we put on the material? The cells make their own bridge, if you will, to bridge the gap. And now you have a brand new organ made up entirely from the patient's own cells. And this is a paper that we published in this medical journal and when we published a paper, we had over a 60-year follow-up on these patients. This actually shows a blood vessel. Same strategy here. We're creating a blood vessel, but instead of using urethral cells, we're using blood vessel cells. Same strategy, we use muscle cells on the outside. We use the cells that line the blood vessels on the inside. We place these in bioreactors that exercise these blood vessels for a few weeks. And once the structure is complete, we basically then put it back in this oven-like device, let it mature, and we then put it right back into the patient. And this is on the far right, you see the carotid artery. That's the artery that goes from the neck to the brain that was replaced using these techniques. We've also done this for heart valves. This is basically the same strategy here. Your heart valve, as you know, is very important for your heart because it allows the flow of blood to go through your heart on a regular basis. Same strategy here. We create the scaffold, the material, if you will. We coat it with the cells, and we use these bioreactors to exercise the structure so you can actually have the heart valve leaflets opening and closing. Now, we have not implanted these in patients yet. This is still experimental, and we're working very closely with the FDA uh, to, with the studies for the FDA to make sure that we can get it there. But here you can see the heart valve leaflets opening and closing. Now, we've talked about flat structures such as skin, and these are by far the least complex. Because you're flat, they have mostly one major cell type. Now, all tissues are complex, but flat structures are the least complex. The next level of complexity are tubular structures, like blood vessels or urethras, these are tubular rather than flat, so the tubes are a little bit harder to create. You have two major cell types instead of one. And then you have the third level of complexity, which are hollow non-tubular organs, like the bladder or the stomach. These organs architecturally are more complex, the cells are more complex, and the functionality is more complex. There's more interaction with other organs. But the same strategy is what we follow. We basically go to the patient who has a deceased organ, the injured organ. We take a very small piece of tissue from the patient, less than half the size of a postage stamp. We then expand the cells outside the body, two major cell types. We then have enough cells for our construct. These are muscle cells on the outside. Epithelial or lining cells, bladder lining cells on the inside. We then create the three-dimensional structure in the shape of the bladder of the organ. We coat the outside with the muscle cells. We coat the inside with the lining cells. Again, very much like baking a layer cake. 
Once we're done with the layering, we put this back in this oven-like device and we let it cook, if you will. We let it mature. And a few weeks later, we put it right back into the patient. And that's exactly what we did. These are actually organs that we created, that we implanted into patients. And we basically follow these patients, same like the other patients. We follow these for at least a five-year period before we actually publish our phase one clinical trials, the first stage of the clinical trials. And we are now more than 10 years out from this experience. Another organ we have uh, created in the laboratory that we have taken to the patient is a specific organ where patients are born with a congenital absence of the organ. But they still have a rudimentary structure. Now, there are various degrees of how these organs develop, but some, men, often they have a rudimentary structure there where we can take a very small piece of tissue from this rudimentary structure, we expand the cells outside the body, and we create the construct. This is actually an X-ray, and on this X-ray, on the far left, you see the bladder. On the far right, you see the rectum. And in the middle, you see this area that is actually absent. We take a small biopsy of the rudimentary structure, and we then create the structure and put it right back into these patients who were born with a congenital absence of this organ. And also, we published this work just, last, uh, just about 18 months ago, also in this journal. Uh, this medical journal, and when we published this paper, we actually waited until we had an eight-year follow-up to make sure that these patients continue to do well long-term. So basically, we've talked about uh, uh, these organs, and they function very well. They function like a normal organ, uh, and they continue to do well, and we continue this clinical experience. So we've talked about flat structures such as skin, which are the least complex, tubular structures, which are the second level of complexity, hollow non-tubular organs, which are the third level of complexity, but by far the most complex organs are the solid organs like the liver or the heart. And these are much more complex, and we're using various strategies to create these organs. For example, we take discard organs, and we use very mild detergents to wash the cells away and we're left with a skeleton of the organ, if you will, but we're able to preserve the blood vessel tree, as you see here, in this liver. So basically, we wash the cells away, like put them in a washing machine. We then, once the cells are washed, we repopulate the cells with the patient's own cells, creating these structures that function experimentally and preclinically just like a normal liver would in terms of metabolizing drugs and secreting the things that livers secrete. So now that we have this experience of creating these tissues and organs, the challenge really becomes, how do we make sure that we can take these technologies where we create these organs by hand, and how can we actually scale it up? How can we actually produce these in large quantities so that we can provide these organs for hundreds of thousands of patients who need them, and to do so in a much more efficient way? And that's where bioprinting comes in. And we started looking at 3D printing over 11 years ago just as a way to scale up the production of these structures. 11 years ago, we had already put in some of our initial organs, and we were thinking, how are we going to make this in an automated manner? How will we actually automate the process to make these organs in large quantities? So we basically started looking at 3D printing using your typical desktop inkjet printer. And the concept was that we would basically drop the cells, just like if you were doing an inkjet printing in your desktop at home, but instead of using cells, instead of using ink, we would use cells. And we would have these cartridges, and, uh, and we modified these printers with a 3D elevator. So here you see the inkjet uh, cartridge. Instead of using ink, we're using cells. And here's your typical desktop inkjet printer from uh, 12 years ago a Hewlett Packard printer, and it's going back and forth. Each time it went back and forth, there was a 3D elevator that lowered itself. There's a two-chamber heart that was printed using these techniques, and basically four hours later, this structure started beating, and these are the heart cells beating together. When we started doing this about uh, 11 to 12 years ago, 
we basically were using, again, your discard printers, and we realized that these structures, even though biologically the cells would survive, they did not have the structural integrity, the rigidity necessary for us to actually implant these in a patient. And that's really when we started to work on much more sophisticated printers that we built in our, at our institute. These are all uh, technologies that we brought together by building these structures that actually can now print tissues and, and structures that, in fact, have the structural integrity necessary to implant them. And the way that these work is that basically you have these, these uh, jets of uh, uh, cells that go down, and it's basically like building a pyramid, if you will. You're building it one block at a time and allowing channels to be built in through the printing process so that the blood flow can go through these organs and actually feed them and allow them to survive. The resolution of these printers is extremely high. We can actually print the size of 1 80th the diameter of a regular human hair. That's the type of resolution we can get with these printers. And basically what we have done is we have worked extensively over the last 12 years building software systems that allow us to actually capture images from commercially available systems that are currently available in every major hospital where this 3D imaging is actually available from an x-ray. So uh, you go to the hospital, get an x-ray. From the x-ray, we can actually get this 3D imaging, and we can then download that 3D imaging into a digital file that gets converted and sent to the printer software, and it activates the printer to print the structure to replicate what the human organ looks like. And that's exactly what you see here, printing this kidney structure that you see in this video. And basically, we have also worked by engineering kidney structures. These are miniature kidneys that we have implanted preclinically, and they show the production of urine, and they basically have the functionality of what a normal kidney would have, but they're miniature kidneys. They're about the size of a small lemon. And the challenge for us is how do we create it? How do we move from the size of a small lemon to the size of a full-size kidney? And that's what we're currently working on. So basically, the other thing that the printer gives us, in addition to automation, it gives us also precision. It allows us to place the cells exactly where we want them using very, very fine color that you see here, showing you how fine you can get the differentiation of the cells. And finally, it also gives you reproducibility. So the bioprinting system gives us scalability, reproducibility, and precision. And it allows us then to create these structures in a much more sophisticated manner. This is one of our, our most recent printers that we have developed. This is actually a printing system that we're developing so we can bring it right to the patient's bedside. So the concept here is that if you do have a patient who has an injury, you bring the printer to the patient's bedside, and the printer has a scanner. So first, the scan, the, basically, a scanner goes through and scans the wound, as you see in this uh, video pictorial. And then once the wound is scanned, the printer goes right back and prints right on the area, right where you need the cells. And that's the actual clinical unit that you see on the top right. This is just a video depicting how this works. Here's a scanner scanning the wound, and then the printer goes back and prints with the right cell type, with the right layering, right where you need it. How many people here just saw the last Avengers movie? So you saw some of the printing technology. There is this actually uh, uh, you know, they came to our lab, actually, to look at these printers, believe it or not. But basically, the other thing that we've done with the printers is we basically are using these printers to create what we call a body, a body and a chip. One of the challenges with drug development is that only about 10% of the drugs that enter clinical trials make it all the way through. That basically means only one of 10 drugs that enter clinical trials actually get avail are made available to the public at large at a major cost 
of over one and a half billion dollars uh, per drug. So the question is, how can you circumvent the chances of the drug not working? The challenge is that the current systems utilize either cell cultures or animal rodent studies, which don't really replicate what your normal organ does. So what we are working on is what's called a lab on a chip program. This is a $24 million program from the uh, Department of, of Defense looking at creating what is called the body in a chip, where we can create lungs and hearts and liver organoids and blood vessel organoids and put them all together on microchips using the patient's own cells and bioprinting them so you have reproducibility so you can basically screen thousands of compounds and get to the real truth of the toxicity of these drugs before you ever put them into a patient. This is actually showing some of our heart organoids, seeing that they actually, once we print them, they actually start beating. If we actually give it drugs to speed up the heart, they speed up. If we give it drugs that slow down the heart, slow down these organoids. And if we give them drugs that are toxic to the heart, we actually can detect that toxicity early on at the same similar dose range that we would in a human patient. So basically, at the Institute at Wake Forest, we're working on a, over 30 different tissues and organs. About 25% of these are already in patients. The question is, how can we actually increase the number of tissues and organs, and also increase the indications where we can use these tissues and organs, and that is where 3D printing is being used. So to summarize then, we've talked about using cells alone, We've talked about using cells and materials together. We've talked about different strategies like uh, reusing donor organs or bioprinting. And we also talked about the four levels of complexity with flat structures being the least complex like skin, tubular structures like blood vessels being the second level of complexity, the third level of complexity being hollow non-tubular organs like the bladder or the stomach, and the fourth level being solid organs like the heart or the lung. Up to this point, we've been able to implant in patients the first three types. We have not yet implanted a solid organ, but we have been using cell therapies for solid organs in patients. At this point, I'm going to just leave you with a very brief video clip of a patient who was treated with an engineered organ, and this is from an interview he gave 10 years after receiving his organ. Uh, three years I was ago. really sick. I, I could barely get out of bed. I was missing school. It was just pretty much miserable. I couldn't, you know, go out and play, you know, basketball at recess without feeling like I was going to pass out when I got back inside. It was, I felt so sick. I was facing basically a lifetime of dialysis and I don't even like to think about what my life would be like if I was on that. So after the surgery, um, life got a lot better for me. I was able to do more things. I was able to wrestle in high school. I became the captain of the team and that was great. I was able to be, you know, the normal kid with my friends and because they use my own cells to, you know, build this bladder, it's gonna be with me. I got it for life, so I'm all set. That's Lucas Masella. He's now 10 years, as I mentioned, 13 years out from having received his engineered organ. We still have many challenges ahead in the field. We have regulatory, the length of the regulatory process, the cost of the technologies, the scale up of the technologies, but one thing is certain, and that is that we do have the potential with these strategies to make patients' lives better. And for us, that's the promise of regenerative medicine. Thank you for your attention today.